Doug and Amber, you can take it away. Okay, great. Uh, so the man behind the blue mask here is, is Doug McElrath. Um, and it's great to see everyone. Um, although I wish we could be gathering here in, uh, in our library uh, instead of doing this virtual tour. Um, we hope that we're gonna have some interesting stuff to show you. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, my colleague, Amber Cole, who's also behind the mask. We're trying to do a good job of um, obeying the rules uh, since we don't live in a pod together. Um, so uh, we'll keep our masks on during this. Uh, uh, Amber manages our literature and rare book collections, and uh, she also wears a lot of other hats. And that includes being part of the team that put together um, our recent exhibit on voting rights, which she's gonna be introducing to you shortly. Um, so when Chris asked us if we'd be interested in doing this session, um, I kind of forgot that um, we've been in a state of suspended animation in College Park for the last 12 plus months. Uh, in March of 2020, uh, almost all classes went virtual, the students were sent home, and the staff was also sent home. Uh, so um, the libraries have been offering only limited services. Uh, in the meantime, those are generally limited to affiliates of the university. Uh, the library staff, uh, as I said, has been working almost exclusively from home. And as you can imagine, for those of us in special collections who, you know, our whole reason for being is, is our access to physical collections. Um, we, um, we have found this very hard. Uh, so any excuse to come back to work uh, and pull out some stuff to show to people has been welcome. But more than that, Amber and I uh, saw this as a really good opportunity to discuss how events of the last 12 months have had kind of a, a impact on the goals and objectives for us in special collections. Uh, I think we're, we've realized that special collections are uniquely positioned to uh, engage students and others in ways to help them come to terms with some of the traumatic events of the recent past. And one of the ways that we do this is by, is by focusing our collecting efforts around acquiring materials that document social justice and other important reform movements. Of course, routine acquisitions have not been um, possible with a shutdown library. So many of our goals for the collection are aspirational, but we have been able to um, bring in a few things in the last 12 months and um, that we're gonna be showing to you. And we're of course interested in talking to any of you out there who are doing some of this kind of printing and seeing if we can bring some of your materials into the collection as well. Uh, we also wanted to share with you some of the things that uh, we have already done and hope to do in the future with these materials in the classroom. Um, as repositories of primary evidence, uh, I see special collections as uh, being in a really good place for guiding students to be better at critically evaluating today's evidence and drawing fact-based conclusions from that evidence. Of course, archival materials and rare books have their share of hidden agendas and outright fabrications, but by pulling students away from the almost incomprehensible cacophony of, of media that they're exposed to today and to engage with what at first might seem as very alien sorts of things, we hope to get them to take a fresh look at the nature of information and how to be responsible users of it. So one of the things that we did while we were away for the past 12 months is we put together our voting rights exhibit. And so I'm gonna turn the um, virtual podium over to Amber. It's gonna tell you a little bit about the exhibit and show you some of the original materials um, that are uh, in it in digitized form. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so as Doug mentioned, um, one of the things that we had worked on, thankfully, and able to get done during the pandemic was this new exhibit. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so you can take a look. So this started as kind of a celebration of women's suffrage and the 19th Amendment um, that had all started pre-pandemic. 
um, most of our research was done and we were ready to actually put things into the lobby exhibit, in the gallery exhibit. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So we had to adjust a bit and go to a virtual kind of online exhibit. Um, and as you can see, it's get out the vote, suffrage and disenfranchisement in America. And what we wanted to do was really highlight milestones in voting rights over the years. So African American, women, as well as youth vote, um, and civil rights and equal rights in, uh, in their voting rights amendment, but also highlight the efforts of disenfranchisement that kind of goes up and down throughout history as we have these milestones hit. Um, so as you can see, we have um, a few different topics, including early voting. And what's nice about um, having to do this during the pandemic is we were able to digitize a lot of materials and have those still made available. So you can see um, this relation of Maryland, which talks a lot about early laws and eligibility and voting and things like that. Uh, we actually were able to get it fully digitized into the Internet Archive. Um, so it's available for anyone who wants to look at it. And throughout the whole exhibit, um, we kind of highlight whatever we can for digitization. Um, other things, um, we highlight kind of disenfranchisement um, and efforts to kind of curtail voting um, as early on, as well as kind of modern efforts. And that's what's kind of nice about this exhibit. It includes materials from all our collections. So it includes some of my literature and rare books materials. It includes Maryland history. It includes labor history, as well as if you go to the Today section, includes materials from our mass media and culture and our university archives. So it brings it into the present day and kind of ties in this kind of whole long history of um, voting rights in America. So I'm gonna stop share for a second. And I do encourage you, please check out, I'll send the link out and you could email it, but do check out the exhibit. But I also wanted to go ahead and show you some of the things. Um, so, I decided to pull what I thought would be kind of the most interesting virtually was um, our posters that we highlighted and digitized as part of the collection. So these are actually all posters from the AFL-CIO collections. So if you see at the very top, there's COPE. COPE is the Committee for Political Education. It's kind of the early political kind of voting rights branch of the, um, or outlet of the AFL-CIO. But what we have a ton of is a lot of these smaller posters, which are really kind of ephemeral. Um, and they come from Frontlash. And Frontlash was the youth organization that really highlighted voter registration, getting the youth engaged in voting. So we have a lot of these great posters, which range from this is a kind of petition type poster to these kind of register to vote posters, um, all sorts of kind of different types of voting to these just kind of cartoon posters that the front lash people did. Um, what also is nice is right before we left due to the pandemic, um, our in, we have a book lab over in the English department, which has their own kind of press and they do a lot of letterpress. So this was one of the things that they were printing right before we all got cut off. Um, and this was obviously right around the recent election. Um, I believe right around when Warren was, was in the running. So um, it's nice to have kind of this kind of um, university kind of tie-in as well as kind of these historical more youth voting. And the other thing I wanted to show, which also is ephemeral in its own way, um, we have issues of the suffragist newsletter. And these were, edited and published and also the cartoons were done by the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. Um, so it was edited, written kind of only by these women, Alice Walker, um, uh, Nina Allender, who were all involved. But what this shows is a kind of a nice way that the suffragettes, suffragettes were able to kind of get out their message outside of mainstream media at the time. Um, so this was allowed them to focus on the issues and their message. So they had a little bit more control about what was being kind of said and kind of communicated about the suffrage movement. Um, so, and these are also digitized as well. So you can see them on, the, um, on that exhibit. And I think that is all for the online exhibit. So I'll pass it back to Doug. Mm -hmm.
but we're, we're doing a um, behind the scenes, we're doing a little bit of a do -si do here with collections. <laughs> So now for something completely different, but actually in some ways continuity with what you just saw from um, Amber. Uh, and one of the things that we try to do with our classes is uh, use both early printing and modern printing to discuss uh, how the printing press uh, can be an agent of change. Uh, and so uh, what I have before you here is an example of showing some of the continuities from the past to the present. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have multiples of this broadside from the French Revolution, which um, dates from around 1800. Uh, in fact, this is not all the multiples we have. We have a whole box full of these uh, broadsides that were produced in Strasbourg. And by, you know, First of all, this is great because we can give each student in the class one to, to look at, so they don't have to kind of share the viewing. Uh, but it also, I think it gets across the point of why we do broadsides or any sort of, of multiple. When you think about these as being objects that would have been pasted to a pillar or, or a wall to announce uh, an, important, um, an important announcement from the, government, from the revolutionary government. Um, and if you look at these side by side with broadsides and handbills from the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you start seeing this as a kind of an, a concept that we hope our students will, will start to think about. Uh, and then once you hook them with this idea of the broadside as a tool for change, then we try to discuss with them actually how they were produced and to think about the whole idea that these were ephemeral objects. They were not really meant to be kept in a rare books library 200 years later. But this idea that ephemera can be everywhere, but since, there, since it's disposable, it's also nowhere. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a fun concept to try to get across to these students. And so to kind of contrast uh, these French revolutionary broadsides, um, Amber's gonna show you some modern broadsides. Uh, so I wanted to kind of highlight something that Doug mentioned earlier was um, in the past year or so, um, we have been able to kind of start focusing our collection on, um, you know, highlighting diversity, highlighting current issues, Black Lives Matter, social justice. And one of the ways um, I've been trying to do that for our literature and books collection is kind of highlight how printers are kind of looking at broadsides and, and communicating a lot of these issues for these um, handbills, broadsides, posters, things like that. So I have luckily been able to get a few acquired. Um, and it's something I think we really want to start focusing on, um, especially in the tradition of the French pamphlet and, and this idea of using printing for kind of social justice issues and, and getting word out like that. Um, this is kind of the goal of, of collecting, especially modern reading. So I'm going to again share my screen. And I apologize because I'm actually going to take the camera over to the collection because it's a little bit too big to show otherwise. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the materials. Um, and this includes posters. This one's by Amos Kennedy, um, as well as handbills you can see around the election in 2020. Um, there's also a lot of Black Lives Matter, um, social justice, women's rights things, um, as well as, as you get towards the end here, works by Warren, who, who is here as well, an abstract orange press, um, particularly dealing with the pandemic and, and kind of issues we all talked about at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so that's really kind of the goal of, of the kind of more modern printing, is to kind of highlight how, how artists are dealing with these issues and how that's kind of working itself out in kind of the, the posters and things like that. And then I believe Doug is me. So I, I apologize that this is uh, a little bit, we're kind of bouncing back and forth in time. Um, but in, I, I think to get back to the theme of, of continuity and also um, 
how we use um, visuals to help um, help our students and help others understand um, yeah, some, of the, some of the ideas that we're trying to get across. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed with our, our students, and this is true of many Americans, is we kind of think our history is unique. And uh, when I, I'm ex trying to expose them to some of the antecedents to current social justice movements, we look at abolition and the anti-slavery movement as, as an important uh, antecedent. And um, one of my goals is to show that this was not just an American thing, that in fact, um, it was a transatlantic, if not an international movement. And um, one of the individuals I introduced the students to is a French revolutionary named Jacques-Pierre Brissot de, de Warville. And he spent a considerable amount of time as a young man in uh, Great Britain talking to the abolitionists there in the 1780s. And so he was exposed to Thomas Clarkson, who is perhaps best known for his um, image of the slaves packed into a slave ship, which has been reproduced many times. Mm -hmm. um, Brissot uh, also uh, decided to uh, further his exposure to the whole world of slavery by traveling to the United States, which was a very young country in the 1780s. And he published his own, Let's see if I can get to it here. I'll pick it up. So he published his own account of the, um, of what he found both talking to American abolitionists and observing slavery there. And then Brissot returned to France and he formed the organization opposing um, slavery and advocating that as part of the French Revolution, that this idea of the rights of man actually be exposed to others. And here you see a pamphlet produced by his organization with the famous image of the kneeling slave saying, am I not your brother? Yeah. Clarkson, who I sh showed you earlier also, was translated into French. And so you get the sense uh, from looking at these various things that um, the movement was international, but I think the other point I like to make is you don't really have to be able to read French to get this idea of the kind of the internationalness of the movement. Um, and this is where we get to talking about the power of images. But even before photography, something like Clarkson's slave ship or like the, the uh, slave the kneeling slave, or even perhaps more horrifically, the report that was made in the 1790s by a, a British captain, uh, Stedman, of the slave revolt in, um, in Suriname, where he, he had these very graphic depictions of the cruelties that occurred during, during those events. Um, and, uh, those of you who are librarians are probably going to advocate for having me stripped of my rare book credentials uh, because this book is um, completely disbound. But just to let you know that this is the way it came to us. The collector had decided that um, the text was so badly foxed that he took the book apart, threw away all the fox pages, and just kept the plates. Uh, and ordinarily, I would be aghast, but the nice thing about this is I can now use this in the classroom and each student now can get their own plate and it's much more accessible. But um, ordinarily, I, I would never have done this, but it came to us in this fashion. <laughs> so in, in using these materials, our goal is to show that um, abolition, the whole slavery was in a broader context we hope that that kind of challenges students' prior assumptions 
makes them think anew about what the legacy of slavery is even to this day. And that kind of leads us to the final part of what we wanted to show you tonight. And that is um, William Morris and the Kelmscott Press. Um, and one of the things I've been trying to do is, is come up with some new ideas about how to position uh, William Morris in this context of discussion of, of social justice and change. And um, I think, you know, there's a lot of us who are really enamored with the beauty of Morris's books, but we really also need to think about what Morris was trying to accomplish and what was his vision. And uh, some of you may remember that a few years ago, we did an exhibit called uh, How We Might Live vision of William Morris, where we explored this, and um, that exhibit still lives online, um, the same place you would go to to see Amber's voting rights exhibit. You can also find our William Morris exhibit. But uh, in order for us to really kind of get across who William Morris was to the uninitiated, we, we like to uh, introduce the idea that he was a visionary socialist who hoped to change the Victorian society and the equities that were in it. And so um, instead of pulling some of the beauties of our collection, we've actually pulled a few of the more ephemeral items that um, kind of show this side of, of Morris. Um, and so this includes um, some uh, pamphlets and announcements produced by the Fabian Society, which was a, a socialist group. And this is actually an announcement that William Morris will be reading a paper to the Fabian Society on Gothic architecture. Um, we also have, is this also from the Fabian Society? Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a little um, handbill that goes back to our theme of people, uh, encouraging people to vote. Um, Morris also, besides publishing books in the Kelmscott Press, issued a number of pamphlets and here, uh, mostly for the Socialist League, which was yet another splinter group that emerged in, in Great Britain. Here we have some of his pamphlets um, that were uh, distributed probably, well, you see price one penny, were uh, cheaply printed. Uh, but this idea of ephemera as being a way to um, push ideas out. And then we have a couple of really fun things. We have Morris's Actually, this is Emory Walker's, um, well, I guess it's, we don't know whose membership card it is, do mm -hmm. we? This is a membership card to the Socialist League that is signed, no, it's Emory Walker's card. Um, and it's signed by, by William Morris. And if you look closely, the model for the, uh, for the blacksmith hammering away there is William Morris. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't, he wasn't above um, uh, serving as the model of the ideal socialist. Um, and then finally, we have another um, little announcement uh, of an event of the Hammersmith branch of the Socialist League, which was Morris's branch uh, in 1890. Um, and so these are more examples of, of how we try to use ephemera to introduce kind of complex ideas and and concepts, um, but we can't talk about William Morris without bringing in something from the Kelmscott Press itself. Uh, certainly not to a group of printers. Um, about 10 years ago, when we did the exhibit, we realized that we had one glaring omission in our Kelmscott Press collection. We had a Kelmscott Chaucer, but we did not have Morris's utopian work, News from Nowhere. And um, Fran, our good friend, Fran Duraco, who's on this call, um, has been looking for a copy of this for us for about 10 years. <laughs> and uh, we were very fortunate that she found one in the last couple months. Uh, so we are showing our, our newest acquisition and one that kind of helps complete our Helmscott Press collection. We have just a couple of very small omissions in it, um, but we have just about everything that, that Morris printed. And uh, just to show it side by side with 
the uh, broadside that ran and Chris Manson at Perfect yeah. Pro Press. Thank you for did. showing. <laughs> um, and you can see where they got the, you can see where they got the image. <laughs> exactly. So I know this has been uh, something of a, a whirlwind uh, tour, uh, only loosely organized around a few themes that we hope you enjoy getting a little bit of a glimpse of what we have here at Hornbake. Uh, we really hope that uh, if everybody gets vaccinated and the variants don't get out of control, that the public will be able to come back and use our collections this fall, maybe sooner. Uh, but we certainly appreciate your attention. And I think Amber and I would be happy to entertain questions or if you'd like to look at something again, we'll, we'll grab it and put it back under the document camera. And Doug, what are the plans for bringing back the students at this point? Um, the president of the university has announced that he expects the fall semester to be as close to normal as possible. Huh. So, um, and that means almost all classes, except maybe the gigantic, you know, 500 student class, uh, yeah. almost all classes will be in person. Good news. Um, Hey, um, Doug and Amber, thanks so much. I really liked the presentation. And uh, like you guys, I miss just gathering, which will happen again sometime in the future. Um, I really appreciated that you um, showed and highlighted the, uh, the work that William Morris did in the popular press. Because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes he gets slagged for being like a limousine liberal, like, oh, and he just yeah. printed these fancy books. But actually, he was printing at every level of, um, of every price point from free handbills to, to penny pieces. And so I'm really glad that you, uh, that you showed that stuff. And even, you know, like after the anarchists took over Commonweal, Morris still funded them. You know, so I don't know. I really, I really <laughs> love that you showed that stuff. There's an ad for Commonweal. <laughs> <clears throat> Doug and Amber, one other question, uh, talking about reaching out to students, what is the mechanism and do you have, do you offer little seminars or do you, you have your exhibit, but then do you have programs, et cetera, as well? Yeah, uh, you know, it's a combination of all the above. We certainly try to use our exhibits as one uh, way to, um, entice instructors to have their students come over. Um, we do a lot of outreach. We, we, uh -huh. we reach out to professors and say, hey, you know, uh, I see you're teaching this class. You realize we have this material over in special collections that your students might be interested in using. Um, and we do have an instruction space that's separate from our reading room where we can, where we can bring classes. And, um, you know, I've always been of the opinion that you know, we don't want to destroy our collection, but you know, our collection is here to be handled. Um, you know, why, why do you have a collection at, at a university if it's not open for undergraduates to, to use? So um, I've been, I've been uh, pretty accepting of, of some wear and tear to the collection. Um, and, um, you know, we work with our preservation department to shore up our stuff as much as possible. And, uh, and I can say even during the pandemic, I've still been teaching virtual classes. Um, so I have, you know, some English department um, professors I work with, but also I, I was giving virtual tours to the entomology department just because they were interested in kind of old books on bugs. Um, so my, even my audiences for classes and instruction kind of vary differently from people who are into the art of the book, people who are into the history, the, the literature of it, to just, you know, topical books that that yeah. that incoming students could be attracted to because of the art or because of the, the book itself so, so things are still going on even though we're technically closed excellent, excellent. i just want to say thank you i think that this presentation was really good i'm glad you guys went ahead and did your get out the vote and that you did it as a website so it can still be shared I'm working on a similar kind of thing. I, I'm on the board of um, 
historic Shepherdstown here in West Virginia. And before I became a member, they had this idea of doing this grandioso get out the vote as far as West Virginia was. And unfortunately, somebody told them I knew how to do those things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure how I've gotten involved in this, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to best do what they've done. But I've actually researched at your library for my dissertation. You guys have just a wonderful collection and I'm so glad you came and did a visual piece for us. Thank you. Indeed. And I, I should say there will be hopefully a, virtual, a real life exhibit coming. Yeah, we're okay. gonna go ahead and install uh, the, the voting rights exhibit probably this fall, um, even though it's a year after we had hoped to have it in our gallery, but um, we're gonna go ahead and do it and see if we can get some more mileage out of it. Mm -hmm. Why not? Sounds like a field trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, every every what March is Women's Month. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like a one time thing. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think as as Amber said that part of part of the goal of this exhibit is also not just to talk about uh, the suffrage movement, but kind of the, the the whole idea of the expansion of voting rights, which of yeah. course is a, a very timely topic. You know, <laughs> just look at oh my God. today's headlines. You know, <laughs> and. Uh, and so I think this is, you know, there could be a lot of even uh, political science uh, classes that would be very interested in, you know, why, yeah. why is it that we're, we're still fighting over voting rights in 2021? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. So timely. Um, if I could just quickly actually ask a question about the Morris holdings again, a bit more relating to socialism, um, sort of building on Casey's point, uh, or her case's question rather, but um, Morris's, some of the lectures that he gave were published by the Chiswick Press and other presses at a lower price point than what the Kelmscott was doing. Does the library collect that material as well? The sort of, well, I mean, and besides just Morris, but the other socialist lectures also being produced by some of these presses that were involved with Morris. Uh, we, we do, um, uh, we're, we're not, um, we, we don't have deep pockets, so uh, we, we often depend on the kindness of donors, but we, we, we certainly are looking to continue to build uh, around those themes that, that you just outlined, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, a lot of people think socialism is, is Marxism, and of course, Morris represented a whole other kind of socialism. Right, right. Um, and, and I think that's important to, to, to emphasize. Um, and, and yeah, so we are interested in more, but we do have, fortunately, our core collection of Morris was more than just Kelmscott Press. It was kind of the totality of, of his vision. And so mm -hmm. we do have a lot of those Chiswick Press uh, publications that he did, another pre-Kelmscott pre uh, work that he did. Cool. I remember that How We Might Live exhibition very well. That was a wonderful, uh, wonderful time spent <laughs> at the Horn Bake back uh, 10 years ago, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if everybody recalls, but that was at the same time that the National Gallery of Art did their pre-Raphaelite exhibit. Mm. And they had an entire room devoted to Morris. Yeah. And so I, I went around telling people, this is the only chance you're going to get to see two Kelmscott Chaucer's on display at the same time <laughs> in the same place. <laughs> well, um, one of the distinctions of the chapter that we have, we have near at hand so many Kelmscott Chaucer's. <laughs> yes, including I think there's one in Fran's house. Yeah. Um, Yes, <laughs> there is. Um, Lasners and uh, George, do you know about the International Kelmscott Press Day that's coming up in June? I do not. Doug knows about it. I think it's uh, the date. I think is going to be June twenty first, and it's going to be a multitude of organizations. Um, I, in fact, I wrote to Haven about it. Um, is one that we hope will all have something, an exhibition, a talk, or whatever. On I that. think, um, a, a Fran, isn't Mark helping organize that? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah, he's actually the point person. Um, and some of us have been helping him out and reaching out to various organizations, but he can give you much more information if you wanted to. You know, maybe you'd like your school to do something, Casey, or whatever. Just it could be anything, and it will all be um, 
recognized on the William Morris Society of the United States' uh, website. Yeah. Cool. And Fran, that's the UK Morris Society is also involved in that, right? Yes, they are. It's, it's we're trying to make it international. Joint thing. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And that's the 20, 26th of June, is it, you said? 21st, uh, somewhere in there? 20, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sort of, I think 26 actually is the correct date. I have to check my calendar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, um, I wanted to say just a quick thing to Doug and Amber and the people at University of Maryland, which includes uh, Matt Kirschenbaum, who's not on the call, oh. who's a really great new member. Um, the people who do your website are brilliant. Like the, um, the Lewis Carroll for August and Claire's show was amazing. The William Morris show was amazing. So, I mean, I love whatever the, what the website people at UMD libraries are doing really great work, I think. Oh, well, thank you. We will pass that on to um, Laura Cleary, who's kind of been the person who has put those together over the years. I mean, she's gotten really good at it. It shows. We thought Amber had a hand in that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All three. <laughs> yeah, Amber, Amber is, all three of those exhibits that you've mm -hmm. mentioned, Amber has, Amber's got her foot, Fingerprints all over him. <laughs> Not her footprints. <laughs> I was I interested want... in your in your current events stuff. Um, did you do you all did you get a copy of the chapter uh, exchange stuff? Not yet. No. Last, oh well, then I'll send. We'll make. We've still got a couple of those hanging around. They they went actually only to the people who participated in the exchange, but we had some extras. And I'm- oh, okay, yeah, that'd be great. John mentioned recently that there were still some, and so we'll, we'll get one to you for your- Yeah, for yeah. Sure. anybody who's interested in, in having their, their printed um, creations get into the hands of, of students, because that's really what we're looking to do is, you know, there's nothing better than having 20 students sitting around tables and each one's got a, two or three items that they're, that they're, they're asking questions about and, and trying to figure out what, what it is they're seeing and trying to figure out how it was produced. And every so often you see them get that aha moment, you know, when they said, oh, now I get it. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, the, the more that we have, the more we can achieve that because, yeah, we can do what we just did for you and, and kind of project something up on a screen, but it's nowhere as effective as actually having mm -hmm. a person one-on-one -on -one with a printed object. Does the uh, do you all have plenty of uh, FDR campaign material? Because I have stuff I could donate if if you're not overwhelmed. Yeah, we, we probably have some in our political collections. I mean, you know, we have Maryland politicians, and so we have senators and so on that were allied. They they, they did a little uh, sort of broadside on I don't know twenty different issues. Yeah, and I have, I have all those. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, every every time we go into a political cycle, we try to we try to highlight some of the political materials uh, that we have in the collection. Okay. We have other questions or or uh, queries for Doug and Amber. Um, I had a question just about the suffragette uh, kind of publications. Would you consider those zines, like when you were classifying things for your collection? We can. Sorry, you broke up. Would we consider oh, them? Sorry, um, I was asking about the suffragette um, kind of yeah. publications and whether you would consider them like in a category of zines. Zines. Oh, um, <laughs> they were certainly. Um, you know, I don't know what the membership size of the congressional, what were they called? The congressional. Congressional Union congressional of Women Union. Suffrage. Yeah, they were a splinter group in the main suffrage. So yeah, maybe um, they were they were like a zine and in, in that they were they had a limited circulation. Uh, they certainly were rent, written, edited Cartoon. by and for women. Even the cartoonists were women, so they, they were very much trying to support themselves through, through this um, publication. 
How often do they print it or publish it? I think it was a weekly. I think it was. We don't have all the editions. But you can find them. They're all a lot of them are digitized, especially after the, the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Um, you can find them out digitized. Nice. Check of course, out. what's interesting is the suffrage movement didn't end in 1920. Um, the the main um, suffrage party became the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. and continued to be very, very active participant in uh, get out the vote campaigns and so on. So uh, it, it is kind of a, we often think, well, that's it. They won 1920, they all went home, but they didn't. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they were highly skilled activists and they were, they wanted to use that political capital uh, to influence change. Anyone else? I have a question, and it's actually for um, for Fran. Um, when you, Doug talked about how you found the um, the Morris book um, for the University of Maryland, could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how you how you hunt up a book? <laughs> oh, all sorts of ways, Jackie. But um, I, of course, monitor the marketplace, and then I um, reach out to my fellow uh, rare book dealers and say, I'm looking, you know, if you have any mm -hmm. leads, let me know. So it, it took quite a while for this to pan out because we wanted to find something that was in um, really nice condition, but still didn't cost what some people seem to think a, a news from nowhere should cost these days, which can be ridiculous. So somehow that all came together um, just a few months ago and, I found one and it was what Maryland and Doug wanted. So it was a nice, a nice uh, happy ending after much searching, but various means, you know, including reach, just reaching out to, um, to fellow, fellow um, uh, book dealers. Uh, so you just, you, you get the word out. That, that, that you're interested and, and here's, and, here's um, prick up, you know, <laughs> but there've been some on the market, but yeah, yeah. they were, had terrible condition issues. Or as I said, some people seem to think they should cost um, probably twice what we ended up um, having to, to do for this, for this copy. So that was a good ending. Mm -hmm. I, I have had my phone ring and um, somebody said, I was, I was looking through your inventory of Kelmscott Press books and I see that you don't have, and I, and I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we, we we're looking for a copy and that says, well, I've got one, do you want it? And <laughs> it's come as a donation. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's kind of the thing you dream about is, is a, yeah. an offer that comes out of the blue or the cold call. Yeah, ever, 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 ever so often, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you to, yes. to Doug and to Amber. Wonderful presentation. It was indeed. Great stuff. We really appreciate it a lot. And we will um, we will express our appreciation with a with one of the uh, pandemic packets. Uh, great. You thank you. A bunch. That'll be that'll be great. Um, and now I think Chris Sweaterlish wants to talk a little bit about our idea about doing chapter oral history before we wrap up. So take it away, Chris. Yeah, um, and, and uh, Doug and Amber's presentation made me realize how much I miss getting out there and being able to look at items from collections and, and uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, can't wait hopefully later this year that uh, we'll be able to get out and, and uh, in person and, and see some of these things. So uh, it, it's uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to take a couple minutes, uh, somewhere along the line, and I'm not quite sure, George, even, even how the topic came up or, or what we were talking about, but uh, the question was asked, well, who do you think uh, is the current member that's been in the chapter the longest? And, and I don't think we ever, ever answered that, but uh, it got me thinking. And um, 
I, in my case, uh, it went back to um, about the year 2000 or 2001. Uh, I was I was looking poking around a little bit. Uh, I know that I heard about APA prior to 2000. I, I didn't even know APA existed. Um, the um, uh, the annual conference in 2000 was held at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and uh, apparently, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they did a little write up in some alumni publication, and uh, which I got. And, um, and that's how I became aware of, of AF in the first place. Uh, so I, I uh, joined, um, I, I'm going to guess around 2001, although uh, uh, the old printed newspapers are actually um, online on the AFA website. And it was actually the spring 2002 issue that had me listed as a new member. <laughs> so somewhere 2001 or so, uh, the first the first uh, copy of printing history that I had was the fall 2001 issue. Uh, so that that puts it somewhere in there. Um, I can't say that that I joined the chapter immediately, uh, although um, I, I assume that I, I learned about the chapter through through National APA. And um, and would have joined uh, uh, pretty if not the same time as as I joined Alpha then then shortly after that. But uh, we we were talking. We thought, uh, uh, boy, there there is a lot. It'd be interesting to uh, be able to get together as a Zoom meeting, uh, which is easy to record and and start putting together some sort of oral history. Uh, I'm not sure we even know uh, uh, when the the chapter was charted, chartered, um, and um, if not we without could, looking, <laughs> not without doing a lot of digging around to look. You know, well, I think, I think it was, um, I was trying to do do some. We were trying to to remember uh, who would have been part of that. Um, so uh, Mike uh, Mike Kaler, <laughs> I think, was was one of the original. People. founding members of the chapter. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there were a few people around that might have some, some no, it'd be great to, to talk um, to them. I'm, I'm Chris, I'm pretty sure that in the early years, it was really New York centric. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it was, it was a New York deal kind yeah, of. I think probably Casey, you're, you're very, very right there. Um, and of course- um, And I uh, think that uh, Mark um, Samuels Lasner told me that he was uh, at the inaugural meeting, which I guess was Ben Lieberman and some other- uh, Of the national app. Um, big yeah. wigs, I forget who else was there. Yeah. Um, and Mark said that he thought he was the young- <laughs> You might've broken up, Casey. Yeah, Casey. Uh, I wanted to hear the young what. <laughs> 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 hmm. Okay. I'll, just, I'll respond. I'll fill in the blank here. Deborah, you asked about wouldn't it be in the national AFA minutes? Yes, and you're um, uh, probably. Although uh, I will tell you from firsthand experience that the records of the national organization are not exactly what you would call beautiful either. Um, they are. They are all lodged at uh, uh, the libraries at Columbia, and th there is a minimal finding aid for them, but um, they're not in, they're not in gorgeous condition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, uh, that's one place we could look for sure. There is at least something there, <laughs> unlike the chapter where we, you know, it isn't really like we've handed a box of, of stuff from officer to officer over right. the years. Right. So, um, but uh, we'd like to get people kind of thinking about, um, uh, uh, doing an oral history. We thought, well, uh, there's a couple ways we might do it. Of course, uh, Zoom meetings for now. Um, we uh, also thought about maybe getting some of the, uh, the members who have been around for a while, uh, put together maybe a panel discussion that we could video mm -hmm. uh, and either put up on the web or, <laughs> or you know, present some evening uh, for, for one of these Zoom get-togethers. Um, but, um, 
we'd we'd certainly be interested in if anyone everyone's ideas about maybe uh, paths we could pursue and uh, certainly uh, uh, share uh, your experiences with with AFA and the chapter the chapter um, and we're really not just interested in in you know the the original founders you know I mean we are interested in right. them obviously because they're leaving us um, but um, you know, really I'm interested in sort of everybody's experiences about how you found your way to us, how you found your way to the chapter. And, and uh, I think that's as interesting for, for somebody who, who joined um, this year, like Chip Coakley, as it is for somebody who's been around since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, think about, you know, we want, we, we don't want you to think, oh, well, this is just for the people who were you know, around from the year one. Yeah. Um, and all this is is sort of leading up to the 50th anniversary of AFA in a couple of years, uh, the national organization's 50th anniversary. So that's has also gotten us thinking that it would be a really good idea. So mm -hmm. Deborah, you have a question? Yeah, or a suggestion. Yeah. So you mentioned panel discussion, but just what about some people, I mean, if people wanted to record their own anecdote. So I have an anecdote yeah. which involves George Barnum and Chris Sweaterlish in New York, um, <laughs> which is okay. how I found my way. And so, and so just having us record it on our own and, you know, and send you uh, and send something to you um, as, as part of the archive. But you have to send it to Chris and me first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you won the award, George. You won the award. Oh, that. Oh, when GPO won the award. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, nothing to embarrass anybody. You know? <laughs> no, that's that's great. That's a great idea. And and so yeah, we need to kind of think about you know all the ways that we can do this. We don't have to. There, there's really no necessity that we need to turn this into something really um, right. onerous and and overly organized. Um, uh, it, it, but we really do need to kind of capture people's recollections about um, the the chapter itself, mm -hmm. uh, because there is something um, uh, there's something extraordinary about this chapter, um, and um, somehow or other, I think we need to sort of we've uh, the internet has has taken away our kind of our number one national cheerleader and that's Casey. Uh, Casey never tires of reminding the, the rest of, of AFA uh, what, a, what a cool group of people Chesapeake is. Um, and um, so I, you know, I, and it's true. I mean, this is, we are, this, this group is kind of extraordinary among the chapters. Um, and so, uh, you know, doing something to sort of capture why is that, what, you know, is, is a good idea, so. Very, and if very I just timely. In, George, also, I will say as the as the newest member of Upstate New York chapter, um, everyone is picking my brain, like, so how do we do what you all do in Chesapeake? Ooh, okay. Um, at, the recent, at the recent Zoom meeting two weeks ago, I think Casey came up twice for that matter. Oh. So well yeah. done, Casey. Yeah. Um, you know, people know you. <laughs> But yeah. uh, and Casey has helped us certainly as a chapter build a reputation. I mean, and everyone in the chapter has helped us build a reputation. I mean, I'm amazed by how this chapter is like looking to me being like, so really, like, what is the secret sauce? Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, they've 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 had it pounded into them <laughs> over and over and over again. And rightly so. I That's mean, right. rightly so. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So objectively, and, and we are, you know, we're widely imitated, but never, uh, never really de duplicated. Um, so, <laughs> um, we've been doing that calendar now for getting on 10 years and Northern California chapter a couple of years ago said, oh, we could do that. That sounds like a lot of fun. And they did it. They did a, a calendar and it was really beautiful. And at the end, they said, wow, that's a lot of work. We don't think we can do that again. <laughs> so. Case in point. Yeah, so. 
so yeah, by all means, you know, get your ideas to Chris or to me or to Don or to Lauren. <laughs> and um, we will, uh, you know, we'll keep talking about this and we'll, we'll, I, we want to go ahead. The, the thing that happened last month when we announced the let's just sit around and do this on Zoom is that uh, my experience with these Zoom things is that everybody who signs up either signs up as soon as we announce it or right before, right after the last uh, reminder. And, and there were just so few people who signed up for it right away. And there were so many other things going on in that two day window that I just, we just thought, Meh, let's do this at a time when lots of people can come. So we postponed doing it. And I think that's probably good. We'll keep talking about it and we'll get it, get something scheduled where we can all just kind of, uh, uh, do this kind of round the round the zoom room uh about when we started and and what brought us in so that would be good and i'll put out the usual uh, the usual plea i'm i'm i'll do chapter notes here in the next few days so if you've got anything interesting that i can put in chapter notes by all means send it my way <laughs> uh if fran if you've got anything about Kelmscott press day that i could just I, I'll send that to you. I have a little, I have a blurby about it. I'll send it to you. Uh, I'm I'm a little surprised because Mark usually sends stuff. Yeah, you know, well, like, I'm surprised. I, he had me reaching out to um, organizations as opposed to academics or whatever. So I contacted Haven, but I had, I had actually planned on contacting you. So great. No, that's well. Any, anything else? No, as as you all know, you know, no. Uh, no item too small for chapter notes. We can, <laughs> we can get it okay. in. Okay. So, um, and uh, something else about chapter notes that just occurred to me, and it just went right in and right out. So if I think of it, it's gone. Anyway. For now. Or you can you can put whatever you thought of back in chapter notes when it comes out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, when I when I get around to. Um, hey, everybody put um, September 18th. That's uh, Lancaster. Oh, yeah. Fair. That's going to be fun. And so um, if you can make it up there, that's a really that's, great event. It really is. That's nice to know it'll be. We are yeah. already talking about hauling Roland Hoover stuff up for sale on our table. So um, that'll be There's one feature. Stuff left. Oh yeah, there's still quite a lot. Yeah, there's still quite a lot. I just I just sold a bunch of type this week, so. Wow. Well, he had quite a collection, that's for sure. All of it in great shape too. Yeah. I, I, I might need some stuff. I don't know if you noticed they also added a kind of members equipment exchange the night before. Oh, cool. If you look okay. at the full schedule, don't miss Friday. Great, great. Okay. Super. Well, George, George good meeting. Good. Well, glad you all could come, and uh, we will see you. Uh, uh, for those of you who uh, would like to join us, uh, the Baltimore Bibliophiles have had the un unbelievable error in judgment to ask me to talk about the GPO picture book uh on april 20th so you're welcome to uh to join in on that i'll put that in chapter notes yeah and um i will try not to uh embarrass myself or my former employer very much so. uh, <laughs> open season on gpo yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what i what i really have to try to do is is prevent my former boss from showing up because <laughs> he he bless his heart he can't resist helping me <laughs> i gave one of these live uh, about a year and a half ago and he came and and i was i was grateful enough for his contributions but he kept diving in and throwing me off <laughs> so anyway uh we'll we'll try to keep him away okay well, george said that's april 20th yeah i uh is, i think that's the right date yeah uh, but that's the day that is already circled on the Apple calendar this year. For whatever reason, April twentieth is circled. I think that the, must uh, be um, that must be Langston Hughes's birthday. 
No, is that what it was? Langston, okay. No, not Langston News. Checked on that. I I was shocked well, when I found out that it's Adolf Hitler's birthday. It is Adolf I don't Hitler's know what birthday. Don was thinking. Is that a joke? I, no, it's really his birthday. Wow. April 20th. Adolf Hitler. Uh, I'm sure that's not why it's. I, is it the first day I, of but, spring? I don't know. I went, no. Really? I went on. I have my own theory, but I. April 20th is kind of a bad date in history. It, it was uh, <laughs> 2010, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded. That's 1995, right. Columbine. Whoa. Uh, we we talked to our chapter president. Air defense shot oh. down a Korean jet airline. I mean, you know, this is, <laughs> I don't, hopefully, we, that's why I was hoping Don would be here tonight so they could explain and tell us why it's a good date to put a circle around. Well, and, uh, my explanation maybe is that he only had the the two zero combination with a circle around it. <laughs> but didn't he do it from polymer? I thought that was a polymer plate. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, fine. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. so anyway. <laughs> oh well. All right. Yeah, uh, the, the call is out. Hey, uh, for, uh, for George. There, there's an item for uh, chapter notes. Get in touch with Don and say, what the heck is the, the heck circle is around the 20? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. On that note. All right. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. It was great Thank seeing you. you. Bye -bye. Doug, Thank Amber, you. thanks very much. That was Thank great. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye.